that breaks through every chain. God, we won't be silent. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. Good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you are a guest, what an honor it is to have you here. Thanks for being with us today. You could have been anywhere you wanted to be, and you chose to be here, and we're thankful for that. If there's a way that we can help you, we would love to know about that. Can't guarantee that we can help with every situation, but we, a lot of us have traveled a lot of interesting roads. We'd be happy to walk yours with you a little bit. So if you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. Love to talk with you about how we receive members. If you have any questions about Twickenham, we'd, we'd love to try and answer those. We're just really, really glad you're here. There's a card on the back of the seat in front of you. If you're a guest, would you please fill that out? You can put that in the collection plate when it passes toward the end of our service. If you have a prayer request, Indicate that on the card, and we'll, we'll make sure that we spend some time on our knees before God with whatever's going on that you ask us to pray about. Speaking of the plate passing later, at the end of our service today is when we're going to take up our, our contribution. And uh, today is a special day because in addition to our normal, regular, weekly contribution, we're going to be taking up a collection for a, a, a program or a ministry or I, I guess you would call it our Ecuador campus. Uh, the Hacienda of Hope is uh, a school and an orphanage uh, or at least a, a child care uh, facility for, for children in Ecuador who have either been abandoned, neglected, or abused. And we've got a, a lot of children that we're caring for down there, a lot of children that we've cared for for many years. We've got a team down there that uh, knows what they're doing. They're very gifted folks who've got a lot of experience working with children coming out of the kind of brokenness these children come out of. And so we are the main provider of resources for those folks. So we're taking up a special contribution for them today. You'll hear more about that later in our service. Really important ministry. A really important outreach, and I hope you'll, you'll give generously to it today. And that'll come at the end of our service. 
We're also uh, uh, beginning our, our first step into the book of Ephesians this morning in our uh, sermon time, our teaching time. Uh, we introduced that series last week uh, uh, called Identity and Who We Really Are in Jesus. And we're going to take our first steps into the book of Ephesians today. The first 14 verses of Ephesians are basically one long hymn of praise to God. And so our, our focus this morning in our singing in our scriptures is just going to be all about praising the Lord and thanking him for his goodness and recognizing who he is as our father and celebrating him. So let me ask you to stand. We're going to begin with just a, a medley of praise songs. You should know most of these. And if you don't, make a joyful noise to the Lord. All right. Glad you're here. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above me and behost. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing over His wonderful love, proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children, in His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing else.
Would you remain standing as we share from the Psalms and then the Lord's Prayer? You, God, or my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And will you join me as we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, Father which Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, us Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead, lead us, us not into temptation, but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Good morning, church. No, 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 no. In military fashion, when I say good morning, you better say good morning. Good morning, church. Now that's motivation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ra. Hey, uh, we are blessed that our first duty station happens to be close enough for us to drive home. And this is home still. We may live in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I may serve as the chaplain at the Wounded Warrior Battalion, but this is still home. And um, I, along with that, you know, many of you know, I learned how to be a daddy here in this building. Both of my boys were born in this town and raised up in these walls right here. Um, God is love. And in these walls, I've been able to understand better my relationship with my Heavenly Father as I've learned how to father my two boys. The witness of the fathers in this room have also been an example to me of God's love in action. I look around at all the daddies I've learned from in here. I've seen men in here that are in this room right now 
sacrifice their ego and their pride at Camp Naoti to help their kids better learn about Christ. A lot of us in here can dance. I don't know if you knew that, but you learned that at Camp Naoti. I've seen men sacrifice their time here and their money to walk with others through poverty and homelessness. I've watched men discipline their children here and discipline themselves in their pursuit of holiness. I've watched fathers in here walk out physical illness and mental illness while remaining strong in their faith and in the hope of healing. I've seen dads set and achieve their dreams of being providers for their family and support against the storms of life. It's a pretty special place if you haven't been here long. I've also seen dads who have fallen short. Heck, I've been the dad who has fallen short, who continues to discipline my kids when I'm angry, not out of a spirit of correction, who misses out on quality time so that I can spend it with this contraption right here, who squanders his wealth, who takes shortcuts in his faith, and who worships the God of self. But being separated from my kids and you all for four out of the last six months due to the military training I've gone through has resensitized me a bit to some of these deficits as a dad. But I will never love my kids as perfectly as their Heavenly Father does. Thankfully, we've got a Heavenly Daddy who loves us like a father should, indiscriminately, unabashedly, and sacrificially. We're going to remember our Father's love for us as we celebrate communion right now. Let's pray. Father, Daddy, Papa, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for this time to remember you as our Lord and you as our Daddy, going to bat for us every day, humbling us, searching us, trying us, challenging us every day so that we can grow more into your image and your likeness. Papa, I don't know how you did it, letting your son walk to that cross. But he tells us you did it for love. And you did it so that you could have a relationship with every person in this room. We celebrate that this morning as we take the bread. In your name we pray. Amen.
As pretty as we all look today, and we're a pretty good-looking church, let's not fool ourselves. We're all broken, right? We're all broken, right? Nobody's perfect in here, right? Okay. Sometimes I wonder if we kind of need that time between the, the bread and the cup to kind of process that, to really let it sink in. To remember, like Jesus' broken body on the cross, We approach our Father today in the same state, broken, and more in need of a Father than ever. More in need of the blood of life to restore our brokenness. The blood which is symbolized in the juice that we're now about to drink. Our prayer for the cup this morning comes from a poem I really enjoy. Walk a little slower, Daddy. Said a little child so small. Let's pray. I'm following in your footsteps, and I don't want to fall. Sometimes your steps are very fast. Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for you are leading me. Someday, when I'm all grown up, you're what I want to be. Then I will have a little child who will want to follow me. And I will want to lead just right and know that I was true. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for I must follow you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Father, thank you for your awesome greatness, your unfathomable love, your unlimited mercy, your inscrutable ways. You are an awesome, awesome God. And you have decided that it's your will to be our Father, and we are really grateful for that. Jesus' name, amen. There is a very interesting this week in history kind of connection between our, our first step into the text of the book of Ephesians. If you want to uh, go ahead and be turning to Ephesians chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, kind of in the middle of the New Testament. Um, interesting this week in history connection uh, to what was going on in the city of Ephesus in the middle of the first century. And we, uh, we call Huntsville the rocket city, right? You could call Ephesus the rock city uh, because the most dominant feature of their culture, uh, of their cultural, religious, and economic life 
was the result of a rock, a meteorite, uh, to be precise. Luke mentions this in his narrative about Paul's visit to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Apparently, a meteorite had fallen either near or in the city of Ephesus, and the residents there assumed that it was a sign from the heavens about their goddess, Artemis, uh, or sometimes called Diana. And so they, they built uh, an idol out of this meteorite and, and identified that with Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of the moon, the goddess of fertility. And she was uh, considered to be the twin of Apollos. A very strong religious cult developed around Artemis. So strong, in fact, that when a rumor started that the Apostle Paul was preaching against idolatry, which was not a rumor at all, it was absolutely the truth, when that rumor got out, when the news got out that Paul was preaching against idolatry, a, a riot broke out in Ephesus. And for two hours, this massive crowd of people shouted, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, over and over for two hours. Talk about vain repetitions, right? That went on forever. Uh, you can read about that in Luke chapter, uh, Acts chapter 19 as well. So the temple, her temple of Artemis or, or, or Diana was 60 feet tall, six stories, had 117 columns. Uh, it was over 400 feet long, over 200 feet wide. This stained glass behind me is about 30, 35 feet up in the air to give you some sense of scale. So twice as tall as that. This room is about uh, 80 by 70. So you could put four rooms this size inside the Temple of Artemis and still have room. It was huge. It was, as Donald would say, huge. Okay. <laughs> And it was, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Okay, now here's the connection between what's going, what, what would have been going on in Ephesus this month and, and right now. If you and I were living in Ephesus in the middle of the first century in the month of March, you wouldn't be going to work tomorrow. And you wouldn't be going to school tomorrow. We would all have the month of March off. No, yeah, I'm telling you. No work. And if you, one of the things I've noticed that if you go to Huntsville City Schools, you have a lot of time off anyway. It seems like every other week they're off. So, but in the month of March, they took the whole month off. And they, and the entire month was, was dedicated to celebrating Artemis. Businesses closed, schools were closed. You had the entire month off. People from all over the Mediterranean world would pack into our already crowded city, swelling the population from a, from a quarter million people to, with at least half again that many pilgrims. We would attend plays in a 25,000 seat theater. We would go to the gladiatorial games in the stadium that was many times larger than that. We would uh, go to banquets and parades and raucous celebrations in the temple. A lot of people in Ephesus got married in the month of March because it was good luck to get married during the celebration for Artemis. So we'd probably be going to a wedding or two. That's what we'd, we'd be doing if we lived in Ephesus in the middle of the first century in the month of March. 2,000 years later, the temple of Artemis is in ruins. Her cult no longer exists, and I will bet that until I mentioned her this morning, you had not given Artemis a second thought. She is a part of the past, but not a part of your remembered past, and therefore has no influence whatsoever on your identity. And, and while there were many, many, there, there, there are many, many things that will determine your future, Artemis is not one of them. Your identity, the story you tell yourself about yourself is completely unaffected by this relic of history. Now here's the really crazy thing. Your identity is affected by something more ancient than Artemis. 
It's affected by something older than Ephesus. It's affected by something that even predates the world. I'll tell you what that is in a bit. But here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the first 14 verses of Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, that's a pretty big chunk, but I think it's good for us to get this, the text in front of us, to hear the Scripture out loud. And then we're going to go back through those 14 verses, and we're going to reflect on four key concepts. The centrality of Jesus, the identity of God, the nature of his blessings, and the freedom in his plan. Don't worry about those notes. We'll, we'll go back to those in just a minute. After we do that, I'm going to relate a personal story from my past, and the last thing we'll do is I'll reveal what that thing is that's older than the earth itself, a thing that has a dramatic impact on your identity. Okay, so we're going to read, reflect, relate a story, reveal the ancient thing that has an impact on your identity. That's your roadmap for the sermon. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 1. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Listen, or if you're looking uh, on the screen or in your Bible, listen or look for words or phrases that are oft repeated, okay? Great way, to, great way to figure out what's going on with the text of Scripture is to look for words and phrases that are frequently repeated, okay? Because that's probably what the author wants us to think about. Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Christ Jesus. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You're beginning to see a word that's repeated a lot here? Verse 4, he chose us, God chose us in him, referring to Jesus, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And this is one of my favorite words in this text, that he lavished on us. I love that word. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, in Jesus Christ, we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, I want to reflect on some key concepts here. First, did you notice that Jesus was mentioned by name or referred to through a personal pronoun frequently in those 14 verses? 17 times. In fact, 17 times in 14 verses. Clearly, whatever it is Paul wants to talk about is, is not just, doesn't just have something to do with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We'll, we will see this later on in this series, but Ephesians may be the churchiest book in the New Testament. Paul talks about the church a lot. And, and he, he elevates the church, and he celebrates the church, and he talks about how awesome the church is and how great the church is. But everything he wants to say about the church and, and, and our identity is purely derivative. Anything good or great or awesome about the church is derived from its connection to Jesus. If you separate us, the church, from Jesus, then all you've got is a group. 
But if that group is connected to Jesus Christ, then what you've got is a church. One of the mistakes we have made in our, church, in our fellowship of the churches of Christ, and if I were Baptist, I'd, I'd be confronting us on what we did in the Baptist church, and if I were Catholic, I'd be confronting us what we, with what we did in the Catholic church, but we're Church of Christ here, okay? So one of the mistakes we have made in the past was talking more about the church than we did Christ. We talk more about how we do things than the things Jesus has done, which is kind of like telling somebody about your tour of the space center, and all you can talk about is, is how straight the grout lines were in the tile. They were really straight. That, I don't think that we meant to get off message, but we did. And, I, and frankly, I don't think God was real surprised by that. Our propensity to drift is one of the reasons Jesus commanded us to remember his sacrifice whenever we meet. One of the reasons he gave us this, this odd little ceremony that we perform every Sunday, the Lord's Supper, or, or in some churches it's called the Eucharist or the communion. We, we, he gave us that so that we would not forget what it's all about, who it's all about. And have you ever noticed that the Lord's Supper involves all of our senses? We feel the bread snap crisply in our hands and we smell the wine and then sense its tart taste and we see our brothers and sisters sharing in communion and then we hear them singing the same notes of the songs and, and sharing the same supper at the same time we are. God intended, I think, to provide those physical triggers to constantly refresh our spiritual memories. Who we are is a big deal. The church is a big deal, but Jesus is bigger. He's the biggest deal. It is all about him. Jesus is the center of our faith. Okay, reflection number two, Paul describes the identity of God in these verses. He introduces all three persons of the Trinity, which may be kind of a new, maybe you've heard that word before, maybe you never heard it before, but when, when we talk about the Trinity in church, we're not talking about Neo's girlfriend in the Matrix. We're talking about the, the way God represents himself to us through Scripture. It's the idea that God is one and yet reveals himself in three distinct ways. In fact, Paul does this beautifully in Ephesians chapter 1. In, in verses 3 through 6, Paul talks about God, the Father, the source of all the spiritual blessings. In verses, bless you, in verses 7 through 12, Paul talks about Christ, the Son, the agent through whom all those blessings come. And then in verses 13 and 14, he mentions the Spirit, the seal, the mark, the presence of God in your life who shapes and molds and guides you into the image of Christ. It's really neat how Paul lays all of that out in those 14 verses. Now, look, a lot of people really struggle with the Bible's teaching on the Trinity. It's this, they say it's so hard, it's just can't understand it. It's really not. It's super easy. It's like the easiest thing in the world. The, the Trinity kind of makes Legos look like rocket science. It's so easy. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have one of our, I'm going to blindly call one of our elders up here right now and have him explain the Trinity to us. <laughs> I'm kidding. I really am. Okay, I'll, I will tell you up front, it's really hard, okay? The, the Trinity is so hard, the teenagers actually gave me a great word for it this morning, okay? It's one of the most Brogdignatian issues in the Bible. That word means gigantic. It is an impossibly huge idea, this idea of the Trinity, of Father, Son, Spirit, one God. And actually, it's one of the ways in which Islam and Christianity are so radically different. They accuse us of polytheism, worshiping many gods, but we don't. We affirm what the Bible teaches in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, what is it? One. 
There is one God. But we also affirm what the Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and in many other places. God said, let us make humans in our image and in our likeness. Note the tense of those pronouns there. There is tension, and there is mystery, and there is truth in the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not so much about our identity as it is about God's identity, God's nature. But, but if we don't speak the truth about who God is, we are absolutely going to be wrong about who we are. Everything we are has to come out of who God is. So if anybody ever tells you or you want to think that theology is not important or relevant, that is absolutely false. What we think about God, as that quote that was on the screen a little bit earlier indicated, is the most important thing that we can, that we can think about, that we can be sure about. So this idea of the Trinity is one we'll come back to in subsequent sermons down the road, but I, I wanted to get it out there because it's in this text. It's vitally, vitally important. I find great comfort knowing that the infinite, almighty, incomprehensible God presents himself to me in ways that I can relate to as father, as brother, as guide. Okay, we're still working our way toward that thing that is even older than the earth that has a profound impact on your identity. So hang in there. Two more reflections. So there's the centrality of Jesus, the identity of God. Third reflection concerns the nature of the blessings he's given us. Look at verse 3. Praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is a huge verse. Need to unpack a couple of things here. First of all, the heavenly realms is not talking about heaven. It, this is not a, a, a geographical location. It's more of a dimension of reality. It's relational, not spatial. You can't measure it, but it's the piece that's missing from many of our lives. It has no volume, but it's what fills that God-shaped void in your life. It's Paul's way of talking about a side of reality that you can't see with your eyes or test in a lab, but it is real, it is serious, and it is all around us. There's the physical world that we experience with our senses. We can see it, we can hear it, we can smell it, we can touch it, we can taste it, we can measure it, we can manipulate it, we can even manage it most of the time. But there is another reality, a spiritual reality. Later on in Ephesians, Paul will, will tell us that our fight is not against people. Our fight is against spiritual forces. It, 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 and just as the battle is a spiritual battle, the blessings that he's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 1 are, are spiritual blessings. In another book, he will call these blessings gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. We can see and experience the evidence of these and a thousand other spiritual blessings, but they are decidedly not physical. They're spiritual. They are treasures, the kind Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6, treasures that are kept in a place where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. That's the kind of blessings that Paul says God gives us. Contrary to what people like Joel Osteen or Creflo Dollar or other prosperity preachers tell you, God is not going to make you big and rich. I've never understood this. Why would God, people say that God wants you to be rich. God wants you to have abundance. And, they, and they, what they mean is that God wants you to have a lot of money. Never understood this. Why would God want you to have a lot of money when Jesus himself said, that's the thing that will make it hard for you to go to heaven? But God wanted us to get there, right? So why would he make it hard for us to get there? God is going to grant you contentment. God is going to provide you and me with peace. He's going to grace us with a forgiven past and a purpose for today and an unshakable future. And Paul says he is not going to be stingy with these spiritual gifts. He's going to give them all to all of us who are in Christ. First lie that was ever told about God was about his generosity. Satan convinced Adam and Eve that God was holding back. He wasn't. He never has. He never will. 
One more reflection. This one regards the freedom of his plan. A lot of folks get really exercised about a word in verse 5. Predestined. Predestined. Sounds awfully deterministic, doesn't it? It's like God predetermined who is going to be in and who's going to be out. He's predetermined who's going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. Like the game is rigged before you even get a chance to play. That, that little word in verse 5, predestined, has caused more polarization in Christendom than Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders combined. The very polarizing word. On one side, there are, are those who emphasize God's sovereignty, his authority as the creator. He, he has the authority to irrevocably decide and determine and foreordain who gets saved and who doesn't. Generally, we call those folks Calvinists after a 16th century theologian named John Calvin. Sometimes that's called the Reformed tradition. A lot of Presbyterians lean that way. Some Baptists lean that way. On the other side are those who emphasize free human will. Each man or woman freely decides whether to accept God's gift of free salvation. These folks are typically called Arminians, named for a 16th century theologian named Jacobus Arminius. They're also called Churches of Christ, okay? So they're, they're the two guys. Which is it? Is it, is it God's decision or is it ours? Before you decide, there, you need to know there are problems with both. If you think it's God's decision alone, that, that God's sovereign choice decides who does and does not get to be saved, then I, I got to tell you, that just sounds unjust, especially if you're not one of the chosen. If you're not predestined for salvation, you're doomed from birth. No matter what you do, I don't quite see how that's just. And there are some scriptures that would mitigate against it. On the other hand, if, if you think it's our decision alone, yours alone, that ignores some scriptures too, and it opens the door to a wicked little sin called self-righteousness. I'm saved because I was good. You're lost because you're bad. I'm saved because I have a tender heart. You have a hard heart, therefore you're lost. I'm saved because I reached the right interpretive conclusion. You're lost because you did not. How about this? Instead of either this one or that one, why don't we try and? It is God's decision and ours. God's sovereign decision was to save and spiritually bless those who are in Christ. You and I decide whether we want to be in Christ or not. God still makes the first move. And let me tell you something. If he had not made the first move, if God had not taken the initiative, you could decide for Jesus all day long and it wouldn't matter. God made the very first move. God took the initiative. He made the way. We still have the freedom to accept Christ or to reject him. Okay, those are the four reflections. And they all appear to have more to do with God and how he works than they do with your identity or mine. But unless you and I know God, we will not really be able to know ourselves. Here's why. You remember that definition that I gave you last week about identity? Your identity is the story that integrates a remembered past, a perceived present, and an anticipated future. Your identity is the story you tell yourself about yourself. Well, here's a part of my story. My parents married in 1954. That's Norris and Ann Vickery right there, walking down the aisle at their wedding. Can't really see it very well, but Dad has got some wicked patent leather shoes on right there. Really nice. And that woman that he appears to be looking at that's sitting down was an old girlfriend whose name I believe my mother told me was Jezebel. <laughs> After my mom saw that picture of Dad smiling at Jezzy, that was their first marital argument. So 
What was that all about? By early, that was 1954, uh, July 1954, more than anything, that mom and dad wanted to start a family. They wanted to have, to have children. And by early 1955, mom announced the happy news that she was pregnant. But within a few weeks, she miscarried. A few months later, she received good news from her doctor. She was pregnant again. But again, she lost the baby. That happened three more times in the succeeding four years. I have marveled at their determination. The, the will to embrace the joy of confirmation from the doctor. And back then, that's where you had to go to get it. The, the courage to dare to choose a name, to paint a nursery, to share the news with family and friends, only to experience disappointment again and again and again and again and again, five times over. But that determination was finally rewarded. In 1959, they welcomed their first full-term healthy baby, me. I was probably 15 or 16 before they told me that story. 15 or 16 before I learned that I had five siblings waiting for me in heaven. Even then, I'm 15 or 16 years old, even then when the three most important things in my world were girls, Ford Mustangs, and girls, <laughs> the knowledge that my mother and father had tried six times to get me into the world hit me with existential force and I didn't even know what the word existential meant. I remember when they told me that in the kitchen, going to my bedroom and sitting down and going, wow, I was a really wanted child. My parents really, really wanted me. Knowing about my parents and what they went through to bring me into their family had a profound impact on the story I tell myself about myself. So, about that thing that is older than Artemis, older than Ephesus, that thing that even predates the earth itself, that thing that can have a profound impact on your identity. Look at verse 4. God chose us in Christ. Read these last few words there out loud with me. Before the creation of the world. My parents tried for five years to have a have a child. God has been waiting for you and me for eons. Before the world you live on even existed, you were a gleam in the eye of God. He, he chose a name for you. He prepared a place for you. I, I, I taught a class on Genesis uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, and I asked some folks in, in the classroom what they thought about that, and one woman, a new mother, said, it's like in creation, God was preparing a nursery for the baby. That's what this planet is. It's a nursery, and we are God's babies. The next time, the next time somebody dismisses you, the next time somebody despises you, the next time somebody rejects you, the next time you feel worthless or useless or hopeless, you remember that verse. God chose you before the creation of the world. You are his child. He loves you. If you are in Jesus Christ, you have been adopted into his family. Don't ever let anybody convince you that you are not worth anything because God gave everything to make you 
and me, his children. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Praise to our Father for what he has done. Reflect on this first verse for a moment, and then we'll sing together. Jody, thanks. Amen. And it's interesting that we would be thinking about the concept of children, as we've already mentioned, we'll be sharing together about some of God's children who live a little bit further away than uh, most of us do, and that's those kids who are at the Hacienda of Hope in Ecuador. The last few weeks, we've been preparing for this day as we take our yearly contribution. And you've heard in the last couple of weeks some interesting stories about some of the kids that we take care of. It is important to note, as you'll see this morning, that it's not just about caring for those kids, but we are also striving to get those kids back into a family when it's an appropriate time to do that. And this morning's story to set up our contribution this morning is about that very fact, a family who has been reunited. So if you would give your attention... Uh, to the screens, and then Steve Owens is going to come have a prayer of blessing over our contribution before we take it this morning. We received Hope and Yvonne um, because of some abuse that was taking place in their home, uh, something that was, the abuse was not uh, from mother, but very much neglect of mother because she was not supervising and, and watching the kids like she should. Soyla, from the beginning, wanted her children back, showed that she loved her children, asked how her children were, appeared and came to every visit that we allowed her to have. Soyla is a hard worker. Uh, she's always been a hard worker. She makes bizcochos, which are biscuits, Ecuadorian biscuits, and sells them on the buses. We had to wait on uh, re putting the children back in the home, mostly because of the aggressor uh, was still out. He was not in jail yet, and so we, we worked on that side 
also pressuring the judge and the police to actually make an arrest on uh, the family member that was the abuser. Um, and that took about eight months, which was uh, a lot longer than it should have taken. Uh, but in those eight months, Soila was able to get her house uh, ready for the two kids to come back. We were able to work on a plan for her to have supervision of the children at all times once uh, we did return them. <laughs> we let her come to church services to see her kids uh, on top of any other family visit. Uh, and so she started coming to every church service um, that she could come to. Uh, but after putting the kids back in the home, she continued coming and she's very active, uh, wants to participate in the church activities, loves to talk about whatever we're talking about in class, uh, participates a lot and has a lot of good things to say. So she's very much embraced even the church here. It's a story of rescue for the whole family uh, because Soyla didn't know what to do, didn't know how to handle her children, didn't know how to protect her children. Um, and now she's learning how to protect them. She's learning how to take care of them. They feel safe with her uh, and they know that they have a family here and they really rely on us as a family to help them uh, continue forward in, in this adventure. Okay, we're going to be taking an offering here very soon. I think you know we've challenged this church to, uh, uh, between the challenge of 256000 plus the weekly budget, almost $280,000 we're asking for today. Now, I know there may be somebody here that says, oh, shoot, I forgot. That's okay. You got all week, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> we still have pledge cards out here. Uh, for you if, if you can't do it today and you want to do it throughout the year but uh, you know as I've prayed I, obviously I've prayed that we can we can raise what we need to, to keep the mission going that, that God has guided us to in, in Ecuador it's a great mission if you've seen some of these uh, videos over the few weeks here uh, we're making a, a real impact and I've prayed that we will meet the challenge but I also prayed that we can just remember how blessed we are we are so blessed, and it's God's blessings, right? If we have a day, another day, God gave it to us. Whatever money we have is God's money. It's really a question of how we're going to spend his money. It's not ours. It's, it's us giving it back that he's given to us. So let's all be mindful of that every day we live. If you'll bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the blessings that you've given us. We're so grateful to be your children that Jody has pointed out so well today. What a blessing. And Lord, we just want to share those blessings with others. And this morning, we want to thank you and praise you for the guiding us and leading us in the mission in Ecuador. Uh, what a wonderful way to impact the country of Ecuador. And we just pray that we can, we can bless that, that we'll be willing to give of, of what you've given us and what is really yours and give it to that mission. We're so thankful for your son and his example, and we just pray that we can look to him and glorify you not only in this giving but in everything we do every day of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take our offering. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth. From the ends of the earth. 
from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea. From the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Amen. Really, really great to be here this morning. If you're a guest, again, our thanks for your presence with us, and we hope that you've been blessed. These things as we close. Another great ministry that we have who is doing some fundraising is HICLC, our Huntsville Inner City Learning Center. They have two fundraising efforts this month. They're bringing actor, comedian Henry Cho to Willowbrook Baptist this Friday, March the 11th. Uh, Cho's comedy is clean and can be enjoyed by the whole family, and tickets are sold right out in this lobby to my right this morning. So you can pick one up and join them on Friday night. The Learning Center is also selling cake pop baskets for Easter. One basket of six pops is $15 and two are $25, and they'll be available for pickup on March the 26th through the 27th. You can contact Rebecca Tucker to place your order. Also, there is a baby shower today for Lauren and Brandon Howard. That's from 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building. They're expecting twin girls and have registered at Amazon and Target. Ladies' ministry, our Lift Higher Women's Conference. Ladies, make plans to join this Saturday, March 12th, from 8.30 to noon to hear guest Rika McRoy. Early registration ends today for the conference in child care. The deadline for registration is Thursday. You can sign up downstairs in the gym lobby following our service here this morning. Secret Church. We are hosting a Secret Church gathering on Friday, April 29th, starting at 5.30 p.m. This year's topic is a global gospel in a world of religions. If you're interested in attending, please call the office or contact Steve Krigger. Directory updates. Our new member directory updates are available for pickup in the lobbies. We've had a host of new members join us recently, and so that information will be available on your way out. You can pick it up so you can find out um, all the personal contact information for our new folks. Tomorrow night, our JFL, Jobs for Life Ministry, is having another graduating class. Uh, there'll be a group of students here for dinner tomorrow night to graduate from that program. Um, if you have interest or more, want more information about that, you'd be welcome to join them for that dinner tomorrow night. So please check your bulletin for those details. Thanks for being here. Let's stand. We're going to close in prayer. And I hope you have a early, great, warm Sunday afternoon here on March the 6th. Have a great week. Let's close in prayer. Holy God, you are so, so good to us. Thank you for choosing us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Spirit that fills us, that walks with us through this journey. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to give to the Hacienda of Hope. Father, help us understand and realize it's not about Twickenham. That gift is not about even the Hacienda of Hope, but it's about you. It's the overflow of, of your Son and your son and us. Father, as we go out this week, help us to see with your eyes. Help us to give a cup of water in your name. Thank you for the love of Jesus. In his name, amen.